So um, yes, welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the, is this now the fourth, third, fourth master event? It's uh, the second, the second. This is exactly last year's was a pilot edition. Yeah, and this is the, this is this, the second it's edition. Only the second, it feels like, anyway, anyway, right. So, <laughs> okay, folks, so what, welcome to the second uh, master's event. My name's Roddy Van. I'm an academic at the um, University of York in the UK. So I'm a tokamak scientist. For what it's worth, I'm interested in microwaves going into plasmas and sort of seeing what happens, current drive, diagnostics, all that sort of thing. Um, so, so yeah, w welcome very much to this master's event. I thought I'd just say a couple of words about what FuseNet is about and what this event is really meant to all be about. So FuseNet is the, the European um, Fusion Education Network. Um, so you can rearrange the letters in FuseNet as you see fit to sort of make that kind of work. Um, and you'll, of course, come across our, our website. We, we operate across Europe. We have uh, 70 members of whom uh, about 45 are universities and the remaining 25 are, are split across national labs, but also private companies as well. Um, one of the really exciting things about Fusion at the moment, as you will be appreciate, as you will appreciate as well as I do, is that it's it's no longer only even though national lab and university involvement is just a strong in fact probably stronger than it has been in the past we're also seeing tremendously strong growth in the commercial sector and the number of private serious private companies doing fusion is growing um is growing very rapidly as as well at the moment um so what am i here to say firstly thank you for coming along and thank you for being involved wanting to be involved in fusion i mean this is this is the number one thing it's great it's great to have you all here um, but but the second thing is almost to give you a little bit of a responsibility, which is that there are some pretty senior people in Fusion who I have heard say, who have said to me, that they think that the biggest risk to Fusion becoming a reality is not the, the list of technical challenges. And sure, we, do, we still do have some technical challenges. We have some challenges in terms of the plasma physics, in terms of the materials science in terms of the engineering, in terms of the system integration. We also have challenges in terms of things that, that, uh, that go outside science. So things like figuring out how the economics of fusion is going to work. How is the public perception of fusion going to work? So there are a range of challenges across the entire spectrum, but perhaps the biggest risk is not, that, that is not any one of these specific challenges, but rather do we have the pipeline of people do we have the number of skilled people across these areas, across the sciences and social sciences, those people who understand what the challenges in fusion are? Do we have that pipeline of people coming through? And do we have, do we have them coming through fast enough? So I don't wish to make it sound like you're on some sort of conveyor belt, right? Um, but, but we need everyone, we need as many people as possible to be involved with fusion. We want you to tell your friends about how exciting you think fusion is. And even if after your current, you know, so most of you are on master's programs at the moment, even if um, you, you don't go into fusion after your master's program, if you're able to be an advocate for fusion or someone who understands how fusion operates, that in and of itself is a really powerful role to have. So just a couple of words about what FuseNet does. So, so I said we're the European Fusion Education Network. Um, our mission is that, that everyone in Europe has, has some access, depending on their, their, as it were, role in society, that everyone in Europe has, has some access to uh, fusion education, to information and resources about fusion. And we do a number of things. We just, just in the last uh, few months, I'll just pick out two highlights. We've had our teacher day, Dario, that must now be that's beyond its second incarnation, isn't it? So, um, uh, yeah. so how, how, which one was that? Third, fourth, fifth? Yeah, the, I think it was the fourth of my teacher day. Fourth. Yeah, fourth yes. Day. So this is this is a day for teachers around Europe to get together and hear a bit about fusion and to share some some good practice. But another highlight um, is the that um, uh, something we haven't done before o over the last year or so. We've developed in in. Um, in collaboration with a third party, we've developed some materials for primary schools. Um, and obviously that's not very technical. Um, it's in Fusion only is one small part of that, but in case you're interested, the, the, um, the theme there is what sets humans apart from the, the animals. And one of the things that sets us apart is our imagination. And actually, I think you'll all agree that one of the things that was perhaps under stressed at school is that a lot of science is about imagining and about, about our imagination. 
So those resources, I'm not sure if they're quite up on the website not yet, but if they're not, they will be very soon. Anyway, so to today's event, um, I hope, I'm sure you will agree with me that the, the speakers that we have for today's event are really outstanding. We have some, um, some people across the range of the, the fusion spectrum from um, national labs, from public bodies, um, who are involved with, uh, yes, and, and from private companies who are involved in, in fusion, um, and between them, they have a, a huge range of experience and, and expertise. Um, so it's my pleasure initially to, to introduce um, Elena Rigi steele um, Elena uh, is, so Elena, thank you and, and welcome, welcome, and thank you for coming to speak to us. Um, you can read Elena's bio in a little bit more detail um, on, on the Indico page, but just to say, well, I, I, I'm worried. I don't want to say what Elena's going to say, but uh, just to say that, that the European, um, the EU, and the, the European Commission have been tremendous supporters of fusion, of course, over a a large number of years. Um, one of the challenges that I kind of alluded to a few minutes ago is that we is that if we're going to do fusion, we're going to do it internationally, and we have to figure out how to collaborate. And and the um, and the European Commission has been a tremendous ally um, in doing that. Anyway, I don't. I'm not quite sure what Elena's going to say, but I don't want to sort of sort of, um, uh, sort of foreshadow it in any way. Um, Elena, um, you've got a, you've got a massive uh, role of responsibility in the Commission. Thank you for for um, coming to speak to us. Please take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Rodi. Thank you very much, everybody. I mean, I've connected from the beginning, so I could hear what um, what you said about the biggest challenge, and it's very true. Um, um, I will uh, take you through a roundabout uh, uh, tour of my scrambled uh, thoughts about uh, uh, fusion and all this, but uh, you will see that, that there is a sort of a connecting line and uh, a message on the line that I would like to convey to you. So uh, I'm really very pleased uh, to join you today virtually. I hope one of these days, years, uh, I will be able to join you in person uh, to open this uh, second edition of the master event. Um, this, uh, even though only online, but this is still a great opportunity for all of you to meet and network and share experience and lessons learned among those of you who are already going to graduate this year and those who are getting familiar with the fusion world. Um, I would like to start introducing myself and that's um, not an ego trip, but uh, um, I would like to, um, you know, to show you how the twists and turns of fate uh, will still uh, uh, all help the fusion uh, uh, mission, if you want. And how everything uh, everything is uh, connected in a way. So I would like to introduce myself uh, and tell you that you know in my past professional life uh, I also was a plasma physicist. Um, I was a specialized a bit like Roddy probably in the propagation and absorption of radio waves in plasmas uh, in the field of thermonuclear fusion, fusion. So I was doing ICRF wave uh, heating. Um, I graduated at the University of Milano and as a theoretician, as a theoretician, because I thought, well, you know, I can't hold a screwdriver. I better do something that is not going to break any machines because uh, that's going to be really expensive. And then, okay, as a theoretician, uh, fresh from university, I took a three months student assistant post at the jet facility in Cullum, where I was given the, tour, the opportunity to remain and do a PhD in plasma physics with Imperial College London. So first a turn of fate, I planned to stay for three months, ended up staying seven years in jet. Um, during this period, my career took a really strange turn. You know, I started as a theoretician and everything was good. And then I discovered that after all, uh, I loved uh, to get my hands dirty and no, I wasn't breaking any machines. So that was good. Um, you know, so I got my hands dirty with the operational side of things and I start, I loved work, uh, working my way up from uh, RF pilot to a physicist in charge, and then I became an expert session leader. So um, 
for some strange reason, I was told uh, recently that I still have the patent as a session leader if I want to go back to Jet and run it. I don't want to, I would break it now. Um, so this meant though that I could explore uh, issues from different angles uh, and I could speak with you know, theory, experimental and engineering themes and be a sort of trade union link between uh, these groups in fusion plasma physics, understanding their requirements, language, and limitations. So that was the first thing, you know, sort of, mm, I was a bit in the middle of various communities instead of being uh, focused on one. So uh, I did uh, uh, my part in 1997 uh, uh, with the DT1 experiments in JET, then uh, I ended up in Garshing to the EU home team for ITER, which at the time was called the NET team. I think I've seen Lo Alberto, my fellow colleague there, uh, who was also there in Garshing, and I was responsible for the EU efforts on plasma engineering of the heating systems. In 2001, for various reasons, which I will not stay here to, to, to list, I moved uh, uh, to Brussels and I worked in the research, in the research infrastructures unit uh, of DG Research um, uh, of the Commission. And there I took a hiatus of 13 years uh, from fusion. And I ended up managing contracts in radio astronomy. So it yeah, has a link to my past life. Astrophysics, which actually was my very first love in my life, together with heart surgery. Uh, astroparticle physics, space, um, you know, I managed the uh, A contract that uh, took pilots, payloads to the International Space Station, so that was fun, and inertial fusion. So never completely away from fusion, but from a different angle. Um, and also, you know, I grew uh, by handling policy for portfolios, which were, uh, on hindsight, pretty big. Um, so, you know, international cooperation, I created uh, the, um, the so-called Carnegie Group of Senior Officials for Global Research Infrastructures and other things. So, uh, twists and turns, uh, 13 years of doing something completely different, but obviously fusion remains my background. So in 2014, I moved back to fusion, became deputy head of the ITER unit in the commission. Then in, uh, in 2017, I became head of fusion energy uh, research unit in the GRTD. And in 2019, I took over the all of the Euratom, Pol or Euratom research uh, uh, group, which uh, includes both fusion and fusion research. So by providing you these details of my background and career, as like I said, I don't want to do an ego trip, but I wanted to show you that uh, there are endless possibilities and opportunities uh, that the fusion offers, uh, which you may not necessarily see in the beginning when you enter this world. And, uh, um, you know, imagination really is the limit. If you are willing to explore things, even if you are not going to um, continue a career in fusion, which I hope you, you know, I hope you do continue, but if you choose, twist and turns of fate, you go out, uh, your experience now will stand you in very good stead for the rest of your life. And um, you just need to be ready to catch the opportunity when it arises and not be afraid to move into uncharted territory. And yes, I still keep advocating about getting into fusion uh, and fusion as a viable energy source in spite of the challenges. So um, the easy view and the role on the role of fusion. Well, you know, I would like to use this occasion to speak to you about, you know, the 2030, 2050 fusion objectives, how we intend to support the fusion research through the Euratom research and training program. And the fighting climate change and achieving a clean energy transition is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. Um, this is particularly important following the 2015 Paris Agreement and the EU commitment to lead the way in decarbonizing the economy and tackling global climate change in a cost-effective manner. We just finished COP27, so you all know about this. 
So according to President von der Leyen priorities, Europe must lead in the transition to a healthy planet and a new digital world. And this brings us a lifetime opportunity to modernize the youth economy and society. Research and innovation, as well as digitalization, will play a central role in this transition. And uh, the EU's strategy for a green and sustainable growth is pretty, a pretty um, ambitious, you know, uh, cutting CO2 emissions by at least 55% by 2030 and achieving climate neutrality by 2050. Energy accounts for more than 75% of the EU's greenhouse gas emissions. So decarbonizing the EU's energy system is essential to meet these objectives. You will say, well, you know, fusion will arrive after all that, so we'll bother. You know, it's all too late by then. No, <laughs> not at all. Fusion has an enormous potential to play an important role in designing the sustainable energy mix of the future. While it is a longer term mission and solution, it fits perfectly with the overall objective of long term zero carbon, em carbon, not carbon emissions. The Commission recognizes the importance and the potential of fusion power and therefore strongly supports its research through the Euratom Research and Training Program and the Eurasian Euro Framework Program. The challenges involved that require pooling the resources from all stakeholders, including our international partners. This is exactly what Rodi has already said. European fusion research, however, has a proud tradition of leadership and of cooperation, both within Europe and internationally, and is now coordinated through the Eurofusion Partnership, with the European Commission making sure that the technology moves forward as quickly as possible. The fusion roadmap defines all of the major actions for this program. It outlines an approach to address the significant remaining scientific engineering and industrial challenges, including the facilities needed. Many of these challenges have synergies with other science and technology fields. Think only of material sciences and the donors, if MIF donors facility. Um, and obviously, the roadmap is a living document, so it needs to adapt also to the changing uh, uh, environment and the changing pressures and needs. Fusion research, though, today is at an important crossroad and is transitioning from a fundamental science in plasma physics, which is when I started my, my career, to technological and industrial reality. So it's a and it's an incredibly exciting moment for fusion because we are there, you know, we are ready to make the jump into fusion as a reality. It's not a jump that will take, uh, uh, you know, a little step is, uh, you know, I could paraphrase and saying is a giant leap for mankind. It is not something that we will do in two seconds or it's two steps, but uh, we are there. We are, I think, getting ready for it at last. ITER in Kadarash continues its assembly phase with many industries across Europe and the world, providing state-of-the-art systems and components. And it's exciting to see that in a few years, ITER will start operation and will provide many exciting opportunities for both scientists and engineers. And actually, I um, there is uh, I have seen that uh, the ITER actually uh, um, offers internships for next year. So I would um, urge you to have a look or to point uh, friends and colleagues to have a look if this is suitable for you. So, and, but at the same time, you know, ITER is already delivering concrete opportunities for interest industry and is having a positive effect on jobs, growth and innovation throughout Europe. So ITER is a reality, even though it's not operating yet. And it's making its mark in Europe. It's important to keep in mind that ITER is a purely experimental device that is designed to show fusion gain, whereby more energy is generated by the fusion reactions and is put in and will not supply energy to the grid. The fusion landscape is also changing rapidly with private fusion companies, private investors and industry becoming increasingly active in an area so far dominated by public funding research. 
Never like at present, there has been so much interest in fusion as a viable source of decarbonized energy, and you will be riding the wave of this exciting time. So ride it, use the Landau resonance, go on the crest of the wave and enjoy it all. It may not seem obvious, but all these efforts, uh, including ITER, are already providing and will continue to provide inform um, vital information for the next step, the demo, whatever that demo is going to be. There are important differences between ITER and demo, which require a comprehensive and integrated research and development program. On a longer perspective, and for those of you who wanted to join the challenge for designing uh, a truly different machine, demo represents the last step. For demo, we need to change our mindset from pure research to a technology demonstrator, where industry should play already a key role. Demo needs to produce electricity and demonstrate a few assess efficiencies. These are essential features for a fusion power plant that along with the development and qualification of neutron tolerant materials, require a specific R&D uh, program. Um, and so this is all of the technological challenges and there's many more, but it's true, you know, the biggest challenge, yes, is to find enough people to do all this um, in Europe and across the, the planet. Um, and there is, we need all sorts of profiles. So the biggest challenge, yes, is to make sure that we have the right people with the right skills at the right time in the right place. And the rest, I'm not saying it will take care of itself, but uh, you know, it's if you don't have the people, you don't solve the problems. The problems will not solve by themselves. So. European fusion scientists and engineers uh, will definitely play an important role in, in the ITER exploitation, just as my generation has done in the exploitation of JET. They will not only be important for ITER, but also for the development of DEMO. For this reason, education and training are fundamental elements of the Euratom research and training program that, I, that my unit manages. Support for the training of talented scientists and engineers, and I also stress engineers, learning from the research activities in the fusion laboratory, as well as the ITER project itself, is strongly embedded in the Eurofusion program. Uh, Eurofusion will deliver the necessary knowledge, prepare uh, European teams for the exploitation of ITER, and will provide the training of new generation of fusion scientists and engineers. So I would like to encourage you to look at the websites of Eurofusion and also Fusion for Energy, by the way, where funding and grant opportunities can be found, especially through the recent collaboration between Fusion, Fusion for Energy and FuseNet, who have made this critical link between academia and industry. I also I already mentioned that there are internship opportunities at ITER on the ITER website, so go and then check them out. I appreciate that the FuseNet has supported many students and has become a driving force in bringing together fusion enthusiasts throughout Europe. In the near future, this will become even more crucial as we will be facing a shortage of qualified professionals in the nuclear field all over the EU, as well as in many key areas of technology and engineering shared with other areas of science and technology. And by the way, I'm really interested to hear that there is also a scheme trying to catch early birds in primary schools. I had I did the same thing when I was a student for astronomy because I said astrophysics was my first love. And I tell you, you will never find someone so enthusiastic about science as a primary school kid. The challenge is to keep them interested and get them hooked because when the hormones kick in, that's it, you've lost them. So uh, it's a really interesting scheme and I hope I can see uh, results from it. Um, and so one of the last things I would like to uh, take this opportunity to remind you, there's still uh, some month, a couple of months left uh, in 2022, and this, has been the, this is uh, the European Year of Youth. Under this initiative, the European Commission has launched a new European social media campaign over the months of October and November. 
And uh, the aim of this campaign is to attract the younger generations to the nuclear field. We have produced the nine videos that are dedicated to all the different areas of nuclear research and, as, and are being deployed uh, regularly. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to see that we have among us uh, uh, Dario Andres Cruz Malagon, one of our speakers representing uh, FuseNet and its activities in the field of fusion research and networking. So I would like to invite you to watch these videos on the official website of the Euratom Research and Training Program. And if you like them, please share them with your friends and networks. Europe needs a, a vision, engagement, and participation of all of the young people to build a better future that is greener, more inclusive, and digital. And speaking about inclusion, one last thing, if you allow me, I would like to share with you the new initiative, uh, Women in Fusion. Um, Women in Fusion is a global community to inspire and support women in the field through sharing experiences, promoting their leadership and encouraging greater recognition for women's contribution to fusion. This is a collaborative effort driven by founding partners, the International Atomic Energy Agency, the ITER organization, Fusion for Energy, General Atomics and Eurofusion seeks to increase and promote the participation of women in fusion science, research, engineering, and operations. So I would really appreciate if you join the Women in Fusion community and share this news with your colleagues. Um, pretty sure that you, I mean, you, obviously you can support it even if you're not a woman, right? So on this note, I would like to conclude because I think I've taken already enough of your precious time. I wish, full, I wish you a successful event and all the best for your future careers. And I hope that at some point we'll be able to meet in person and share experiences together. So enjoy this virtual master event conference. Thank you. Alona, thank you for that. Um, uh, I, yes. I Yes, uh, I can. I can see some electronic claps and some um, some some actual real claps. Um, uh, Elena, thank you very much for that that excellent uh, talk. Very interesting to hear your path through the technical side, through the um, through the the ICRH community to to running Jet. Also interesting to hear about how you moved between being a theoretician and an experimentalist, and 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 then moved into the the management of fusion. So I think there are a lot of messages there for us about thinking about how careers operate. And I think it's probably even more common now that people jump between um, different different roles in, um, in fusion or even in out of fusion and then back into to fusion. Um, and I liked your phrase that it's uh, that, that we're now ready to make the jump. And and but it's the responsibility sits with with those of you who are on this call or who are at this event. Um, to make that jump, because as Elena said, it's not going to, to happen on its own. And I'm also delighted you spoke about diversity, because one of the key things is that we enable um, everyone to feel that there is a, a role for them in fusion. Um, and um, there have been a, a couple of links in the chat. I certainly put the uh, the Women in Fusion um, link in, in the chat. So do please um, uh, follow uh, some of those initiatives and and please be supportive. Um, so Elena, thank you so much for your for your very valuable time. Um, that was a really really helpful message. Thank you.